kingdom to not even know that they are children of the kingdom. Some of you right now are descended from the tribes of Israel. Look around the room. Yehuda, Yisikar, Zebulun, Reuben, Shimeon, Gad, Yosef, which is Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Levi, Dan, Asher, Nephtali, or Nephtali. Some of you are descended from these tribes, but you have no knowledge because our forefathers have forgotten the law of their Elohim. Mm -hmm. so So let's just deal with what Rome gave us. What did Rome give us? Well, Rome gave us Christmas, as we said before, December 25th. Not the Bible, Rome. Got to discount that. Rome gave you Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a creation. The name and even the image is a creation, a construct. We've got to deal with that. Rome also gave you Sunday Sabbaths. Deal with that. Rome also gave you communion. Mm. Communion predates Christianity by 5,000 years. How is it possible that communion can have existed for 5,000 years before Christianity? Because the communion was a pagan ritual that existed long before Messiah came on the earth. But now the church practices communion, or as it's called, the Eucharist in Catholic circles. That, we have to deal with that. Lastly, we have Ishtar, the ancient Babylonian goddess that we now call Easter, who the symbol of fertility is a rabbit with the eggs, which you find in your Bible in Acts chapter 12, verse 4, your Bible, if you have a King James, still has the word Easter in there. The word Easter is printed in some of your Bibles. Wow. So there was even a deliberate attempt to get us familiar with Ishtar in our Bibles. Because at the beginnings, at the onset, the whole of Europe had been totally corrupted with much of this Mithra teaching. To have the church, the Catholic church wanted the church practicing the Babylonian feasts just with new names. Same dates, same feasts, rebranded. There you go. We have to deconstruct all of that. In fact, I think let's read out this. Another prominent pagan religion that was at the height of its popularity at around the same time as Yeshua is that, called, that cult called Mithraism. Mithras actually share many attributes with Yeshua, including Last Supper, just before Mithra's ascension into heaven, Mithra had a Last Supper. Interesting. Initiates of, Mithra, of the Mithra cult partook of a sacred meal in honor of Mithra that included both bread and wine, which were believed to be the flesh and the blood of a great bull. That's the bull that you saw killed. That was slain by Mithra. Just a bit of history for you. Another thing that really jarred me was this subject of the Nephilim. Those of you who have ever read the book of Enoch, or if you've read your Bible, Genesis chapter 6, the book of Jude, Psalms 82, Peter, the Bible speaks in the Old Testament and the New Testament heavily about something called the Benai Elohim. The Benai Elohim means the sons of God, and they are not human beings. These are giants. Genesis chapter 6 makes it very clear that when these sons interbred with the daughters of men, they begat giants in the earth. And these were a genetic species completely different from Homo sapiens. We have evidence of all of this to this very day. We have um, bones have been discovered all over the globe. There's, there's so many bones of the descendants of the giants, it's such a huge cover-up to conceal it from the likes of you and I. But if you go to Stonehenge, which is not far from here, 
you will still see the burial mounds. You'll see the literal mound. The mound will come out of the ground like a bunker. Those are the ancient burial grounds of the giants of this country. Okay? So there's much history there. But again, on this journey, this will be a revelation that Father will hit you with. Because until you understand Genesis chapter 6 properly, you will not understand your whole Bible properly. Because many of the wars of Israel were with the giants. They weren't ordinary people. It speaks of tainted, satanic bloodlines in the earth. That the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, it's going to be like that in the days when Yeshua returns. So one of the messages that Father will drive home to Israel now is to know the history of the giants. And there's a lot. There is a lot. So sadly, the modern church is doing this with the Bible. It's taken the books of Moshe, taken the rest of the Old Testament, and thrown them out in the trash. How many of you have been given a Bible that's just a New Testament? Have you ever been given a Bible that's just a New Testament? Mm -hmm. In fact, I've been given Bibles that are just the Gospels. Not even the Epistles and the Old Testament. Because that's all you need to know, isn't it? Just the Gospels. Really? They call it dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. Get the words out of my mouth today. That it's just important for you to know the Gospels. That's all. Just Yeshua. Just Jesus. But you need to know a lot more. Because every word of Yeshua, he's just quoting the Old Testament. But if you don't have that, you'll think that he's saying something new, and you'll end up with crazy doctrine like what they teach now in most churches, that we're just under grace. All we have to do is love one another, and that's it. <laughs> but how do you love one another? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does that look like? <laughs> the Bible goes into specific details as to what is love, because your defi definition of love can be very different from your definition of love. But if we have the word, now we have an independent authority on what love looks like. So it's not down to what you think love is or what you think love is. It's what he says love is. And Yahuwah is love. So the church is taking the books and the Torah and chucking it in the bin. Because we're now under Jesus. We're no longer under the law. And they use one of the great emissaries as the ambassador of this hyper-grace teaching that we're no longer under the law. And all of the prophets, oh, oi, that's all dead. In fact, I took a brother, because I like to visit different congregations and build friendships and relationships and just get to know. Mm -hmm. I visited a church just up the road from here, and it was a Sunday service. And I was intrigued because they were very different in the way they conducted the service. It seemed like they had some very strong links to what appeared to be a very Hebraic way of worship. But their overseer told me that he came from Africa, took the Bible, and threw the Bible across the room, and said that we no longer follow a dead word. We now live by the Spirit. And we move by the Spirit. The Spirit is living. The word is done. It's old. It's dead. That's the past. We live now by the Spirit. So they no longer read. They literally believe in just being in the room and allowing the Spirit to speak through them and the Spirit will tell you what you're to do now. They no longer live according to the written word. Depends what spirit they're using. Huh? But don't think that that's just that church up the road. Because Christianity is going the same way. True. That we now live according a life in the Spirit. We're Spirit-filled. Everything must be by the rhema word, the now word. That's what Father said then. What's he saying now? And they put the now over the, the, as greater than the then. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nothing you can say is greater than what is written mm. to me. Well, that's not very popular preaching in churches today. But I said today, you're learning the Hebraic way, the way, the truth, and the life. So we're not going to follow the traditions of man. And they really do that because... You, when you take out the trash, you're saying, this is of no value to me. There's nothing in here that I can use. It has no benefit. So the reason why the churches are throwing out the Old Testament and out with the apostles and living by the rhema word, they say, is because they don't understand it. 
They don't understand it. They don't understand that these very feasts that they say are old are all the way through the New Testament. There's not one reference here that is Old Testament. These are all the feasts that were being kept by the apostles and being kept by the disciples in the New Testament. You show me the New Testament where the feasts are done away with. They're not once done away with, they are kept in the New Testament. But the reason why pastors say, oh, we no longer do those anymore, is because they don't study to show themselves approved unto Yah. They got a master's in divinity from a seminary, which proves you were able to study the church fathers. But did you really study the word? And you'll be so surprised, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you the truth here. Many ministers have learned church history, but then they had to go back and read their Bibles again. In fact, many have told me, be careful of seminary, because I lost my faith there. <laughs> Billy Graham said the same thing. He went through a crisis, that word again, in his faith when he attended a resort, a, 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 sorry, a retreat, where there were all Princeton and Yale and Harvard seminary students. And he went through a crisis of faith and nearly gave up the pursuit of the faith because of spending time with theologians. Take a picture. Take a good picture. Get the focus clear because I want you to study the feasts in the New Testament. The apostles and the disciples never ever started a new religion called Christianity that was putting away all of the feasts of Yahuwah. They're not the feasts of Israel. Notice Leviticus 23 verse 2 does not say the feast of the Jews. Does not say the feast of Israel. It says the feast of Yahuwah, not of Israel. So the authority, the ownership is not earthly, it's heavenly. Does heaven pass away? No. So the feast ain't going nowhere. That's right. But, don't listen to me, what do I know? Yeshua and all the apostles kept and preached and taught the feast. And people always pull out the text in Acts. Well, didn't the apostles decide that the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised, don't need to keep the feasts? You need to understand the passage and read the whole thing to the end of the chapter and then read the book. What they're saying is, when they're coming in as babies, let's not put anything heavy on them. Keep it simple. Just these basic four things and that's it. But keep reading on. It says, for they have in every city Moshe read to them every Shabbat. Meaning, they're going to go to the house of Yahuwah and they're going to read and they're going to study and they're going to grow. Let them grow in Moshe in their own time. The same way we were uh, raised up is the same way Father will raise them up too. They will learn. Let the Ruach be the teacher. We will just say, brothers, we accept you. Do these basic things and you should be good. But in every city they have a synagogue. They will learn. The Ruach will bring them through. Like I said to you when you came here today, you won't get all this in one day. After the course is finished, you'll still be taking time to meditate and learn these things. Let's move on. I love the question, but I always ask this question. The real question is, if Messiah taught and kept them, why don't we? Messiah taught these things and kept these things. Why don't we keep them? Because we're listening to Constantine, 321 AD, he passed that law, that edict, and was still keeping it. In fact, let me share with you one little thing. Do you know the Catholic Church still calls all Protestants children of the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church still calls, this church belongs to the Church of England, it's not Catholic. It's the Church of England. But the Catholic Church has begun the work a long time ago of bringing all her rebellious children back home. She's calling all her children to come back home. And here's what they say. The sign that you are still our children is that you keep our day. Sunday is the proof you belong to us. I'm not telling you that. They document it. Go search me out. 
Look at the documentation. The Catholic Church prints it, and it's in my presentation on the Shabbat that I have, where I show you all these documents, where you can find them, where the Catholic Church says the proof that you belong to us is that you keep the Sunday because no other persons created the Sunday worship but us. You have a question? And it is meant to be interactive. I should have said that before. So you can ask a question. Just a comment, because you put on the uh, about the, the feast thing. And so I did go on Tuesday, and they, they actually said the first day of the week was the Sunday. And they acknowledged it as the first day, but not the Sabbath. But they didn't equate what they were saying with what the word was saying. So they said everybody knows the first day of the week is Sunday, and we go to church on Sunday. And I sat there and thought, so, so you're actually saying you're not keeping the Sabbath? Yeah. But they're not recognizing it. I mean, if you want to, after this course is finished, because I'm saying it so much, I might as well do it, is teach you about the Shabbat from the beginning. Would you like that? Because I think it is quintessential for you to understand do you really understand the Shabbat? Some of you have been keeping it, but many of you don't even know what it really, what is it really all about? What is the purpose of the Shabbat? And I think if you've not really, you can be part of a church that keeps it, but they've not taught you about the Shabbat. So I will teach you about the Shabbat from the beginning. But in that presentation, I go into the Roman Catholic Church and what they say. And you'd be shocked to learn, they actually declare the seventh day is Saturday. The Sabbath is a Saturday, um, but we're doing a different thing, basically, and we're creating the Sunday. Right. It was prophesied by the book, in the book of Daniel. Daniel prophesied that the Antichrist will seek to change the days and the time. times and laws. Very specific words. Change times. The Bible says that the feasts are designated times, called Moedim. And these are commanded, Shabbats are commanded, which are laws. The Antichrist will change designated feast times and biblical universal, universal. Not national, not global, universal laws. Because NASA have proved there's a seven day cycle even in the universe. It's only a few years old, I think it's the last couple of years, showing you the population or populace of the Catholic Church membership, compared, which is green, uh, more Orthodox churches in red, Pentecostal churches in yellow, and Protestant churches in blue. Protestant means any of those, it's any churches that protest against Catholicism. But Pentecostals, you notice that they are separated from Protestants. They're still children of the Catholic Church. So here we see across Europe, predominantly, Catholicism rules. Hands down. Then the blue is Protestants. There's a sprinkling of some yellows and some reds. So you have Orthodox Christianity, which even though they consider themselves separate from Catholicism, still are part of the Catholic Church, as far as I'm concerned. And we look at the global picture now to see that the planet currently has 8 billion population. Of that 8 billion, 2 billion are Catholic. That's a large majority of people of faith in Christianity that obey the Catholic Church. Wow. And you can see heavy concentrations in Europe, which is the seat of power, Rome. Heavy concentrations in America. Lots of yellows here, which is the Pentecostal Church, the Baptist churches. A lot of Catholicism here and also Pentecostal churches in South America. Australia, across Africa, and the Middle East. Across America, the picture looks like this. Greens, again, are more Baptist. Many Baptist churches, purples, Anglican, Adventists, some of Adventists in red, quite big there. Methodists as well, sorry, the Methodists, sorry. Methodists are in red. Adventists in a kind of pink. So that's the distribution of faiths across the Western world. So basically, the Catholic Church has a predominant control and the major influence. Even though they're Pentecostal and Protestant, they still obey 
Rome's holidays, Rome's holy days, or unholy days. Holly is the word, holidays. Naming ceremonies are very important in many cultures. Those of you who are from an Asian culture, you know when I say the word good water, you will take your child to a good water. And what is the purpose of taking the child to the good water? The priest believes there are certain letters that must be in that child's name in order for that child to be blessed. Am I correct? So the naming ceremony is very important. What you name the child is extremely important because it's basically a prophecy over that child. So in the Middle East culture in Israel, naming a child was extremely important. When it came to Yeshua, it wasn't left to his parents. The name came from heaven. So what you believe a person to be says a lot about them. Their name should say, a much, it should say much about your character. So this week's Torah portion, we look at Yaakov, Jacob, and his name literally is telling you about his character. Now he's a thief, a supplanter, okay? We look at many other people's names in scripture and we see that their name is about their personality and their character. It's prophetic. What's in a name then? I would say to you and I submit to you, everything is in a name. Be very careful what you name your child. Hear from Father. Be very careful what you label people as. Because you know you can actually reshape someone's mind the way you label them. You can reshape someone's identity with the way you see them and the way you label them. Everything is in a name. If you haven't already, please go to our YouTube channel and please watch my teaching, Yeshua versus Jesus. In that, I go far more in depth explaining what's in a name. Because in that teaching, I will show you every letter of the name Jesus, Jesus, every letter of the name Yahushua, and show you that what we're taught in church, oh, it's just a translation. It means the same thing. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. In fact, they won't tell you because they don't study it. And that's what burns me. This is my passion. You can go and get more truth in the secular world mm. about some of the scriptures, in fact, much of the scriptures, than you can get from some of the church. Specialists will tell you, specialists in the field of linguistics will tell you the name Jesus is what's called a transmogrification. It's not been translated. It's not been transliterated. Mm. You want a transliteration, but with, from, Arabic, from uh, Aramaic, Hebrew, to English, you will not get a straight transliteration. But it went from Aramaic, Hebrew, Aramaic, into Greek, Latin, and early English, to modern English. A lot of changes have gone on. So from the Aramaic to the Greek, there are no equivalent letters, some of the letters and sounds in Hebrew. So what they have to do is, ooh, take that and put that one there. Because it gives the equivalent meaning. The important thing is to carry the meaning. Mm -hmm. When we look at the meaning, there's some shocks and some horrors in there. Because long story short, you need to watch the whole teaching. The name, and this is where uh, some have argued with me, and I don't mind saying, Yaakov Fresh, go study. I'm calling him by name, because he called me by name, and I'm just doing the same thing, out of love, brother. That the name Jesus means hails from Zeus. You have to understand. And when you watch the teaching, I go into it far more in depth. It's not just about transliterating, it's about carrying the meaning. And the name Yeshua means Yahuwah's salvation. So for the Hebrews, there is only one God. He's the Father God of everything, so it's Yahuwah, and He's the salvation from Yahuwah. But to the Greek mind, who is the Father God? Right. They don't acknowledge Yahuwah, 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 Yahuwah. They acknowledge Zeus. He is the Father God of all the gods. And the Greeks also knew about the giant and the Nephilim, all their, their, their history. Mount Olympus and all the mountain, Mount Olympus gods, it's the same pantheon, just different names. All the Cyclops, these are all the Nephilim's children. 
Okay, the Greeks weren't just dreaming this stuff up, neither were the Egyptians, they weren't making this stuff up. But what they were doing in the Greek culture was taking a concept and carrying it into their paradigm, which is Zeus is the father of God, and if you're saying he's the son of God, then he hails, where do you hail from? Where do you hail from? Hansworth, Newtown, London, you hail from that, well, he hails from Zeus. So that, hey, hey, Zeus, in Spanish, is still the same thing. So, Jesus, one who hails from Zeus. Because he's the only God there is. And if he's the son of God, he must come from Zeus. That word, Jesus, carried through as a transmogrification, they say translation, transmogrification of the name Yahushua. Okay? And it became Jesus only within the last few hundred years. Jesus is 300 years old. Approximately 300 years old. That's very new. Okay? Very new. If not for the Frenchman, Pierre, something I forget the surname, we wouldn't have the J. It's in the presentation. So let, the letter J is the most recent addition to the English language. So Jesus became Jesus. Spanish people still use that one. Okay? In South America, they still say Jesus. And they all know in the Spanish world what Jesus means. They know it means it comes from Zeus. There's no argument there, but with the stubbornness of the Western English mind, we still resist truth. Truth Behind Tongues, if you haven't watched this series, this four-part series, please, 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 do go and watch this four-part series that I've put on YouTube. It will teach you the whole truth about tongues. It's like throwing a baby in the middle of a football match and this chaos and craziness going on. You need to understand the truth before you embrace the practice. Okay? So truth behind tongues will set you free from much of the nonsense. But it's the spirit of Kundalini that's working through the church. And that spirit will prevail in error. So this word that we see, Iosus, Iosus, is, is a Zeus in English. If you break it down, is a Zeus. Zeus father God. The image that we have of the Christ comes from the image that they had for Zeus. So not only was it enough, it wasn't enough to give the name, but even the image was passed on to us as well. And this is where the artist Michelangelo and you know, Leonardo da Vinci gathered the image for the popular face of Christ from his homosexual lover, Caesarea Borgia. So the image you know as Jesus Christ comes from this Borgias family, this guy, Ceres Borgias family, the Borgias. This is where it comes from. Caesarea Borgia was a homosexual lover, I believe Michelangelo, and uh, he wanted to personify his lover forever. He immortalized his lover. And his father being the Pope said, yeah, I sign it off, that's it. This will be the face that we see, and this will be the image that we now portray to the world as the Christ. Done. Controlling the history books. What you're looking at here is the first church of Antioch, and this is where it starts. In your Bibles, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, please make a note. Mm -hmm. Then Barnabas departed from Tarsus to seek Shaul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that, so sorry, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Did it say that they called themselves Christians? They were called Christians first at Antioch. You labeling yourself is one thing, but someone else labeling you a name you've never heard before, they've never heard this before. But they were labeled as Christians there. And it stuck. Be careful what people call you. This is where we see it first. Go ahead. Acts 11, 26. You can also check in your Bible as well here. Acts 26, verse 28, and 1 Peter 4, 16. These are where you'll find the word Christian in your Bible. But the word was added to your Bible. Yeah, that's right. Initially, it was a name of just wasn't taken It was a derogatory term. Like, oh, because remember, they've heard this doctrine before, and here's another to them cult teaching about death, burial, resurrection, and the Messiah. Oh, these are Christians. <laughs> they're mocking them, they're jeering at them. They weren't calling them Christians and Christians in, in submission. It was more they were jeering and mocking them. 
And we take it now that the Christian church was birthed and born and birthed, 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 and jump on the white horse and ride around like crusaders. What you're looking at as well, please, please take a picture of this. I want you to remember this image because I'm going to come back to it again through the course. Because we don't really appreciate antiquity and history. I love it. It's rich. It's, rich. it's filled with meaning. What you're, have you ever heard of something called the Seat of Moses? Or the Bima Seat. That's it. The Bima. That's it. Down here, there will be a, a, kept a repository of the books of the law. So when I go through the presentation, I want to remember that the first church, and it wasn't, I gotta get that word church out, I'm saying church, the first messianic community. Mm. They weren't a Christian church. They were messianic believers who followed the Torah. But Shaul is coming to them with a new revelation of the Messiah that they've not heard yet. But they're followers of the way, they're practicing the Torah. This was a similar setup in Jerusalem. It was just a mimic, a copy of what would have been in Jerusalem. So we're gonna keep moving on. But the seat of Moses represents, the, the leader would sit on the authority of Moses. Not on the authority of Christianity or the New Testament. He's sitting on the authority of Moses. I'm dealing with a mind, a paradigm shift here. My words are specific for a reason. I'm not the anti-Christian. I'm trying to get your mind to think as they thought. Okay? Let's move forward. So in your Bible, this slide's slightly out of place, this is where you'll see the amount of times the word, the way, is mentioned. Remember I said to you, only what, three times you find the word Christian? But look how many times the way is mentioned in your Bible. Take a picture with your phone. It'd be probably the quickest way, instead of trying to write it all down. <laughs> Look how many times in your Bible, the way, the way, the way, the followers of the way is mentioned in your Bible. And then do a word search on the word Christian. And remember the word Christian was added. It was actually followers of the way. Mm. I've done pretty good for time. I think I'm gonna show you a video and then we'll probably close the first session. messianic community mm. can we not talk about this now yes I know the question is directed at me but the question is coming from heaven to all of us in this room think about what she's just said and can someone give a response because mm. I've spoken quite a bit but it's open to it this is meant to be interactive every session is interactive Part of that is obedience to him mm. and in being 
being obedient to him does mean that we will have to change and practice those things that he's instituted. Love that lovely response. Mm -hmm. um, Loud enough so everyone can hear you as well. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was never taken out. Mm. I think that's, that's, that's right. the point. Um, it was, the fact that it was not taught to us does not mean that it was ever taken out. So I think really, if we're saying we are followers of Yeshua, mm. which is the main thing, and we come under him, then everything that he does, we do. And if we're going to take the word, we we take the whole word, not just bits of it. So it's start, middle, and the end. And so from the start, we are commanded by the Most High mm -hmm. that these are the festivals, or as you get into it, you realize that these festivals are the way to Yeshua. Come on. But they are there from the very beginning, but you will still end up by following them mm. with Yeshua. It's impossible not to get to Yeshua without them. So I want to run out. This is it. You said you took it up, you took the baton and you ran. Because how can you find the way if you don't follow the trail? What did Yeshua say? And if this is a rabbinic call. Every rabbi, when taking on a new disciple, would look at the disciple and say what? Follow me. And then he would turn and he would begin the journey. And it was on you to say, I'm leaving behind everything. Not tomorrow, not next week, now. Because I'm not staying here. I'm moving. And I'm calling. It was a privilege. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your Bible when you when uh, Elijah met Elisha? Remember what happened? He met him and put his cloak on him, put his mantle on him, and Elisha knew, I can't procrastinate on this. If I've been if I've been given this call, it's a call. Father expects a response. Not when I feel like it, now. The season is now. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. So Father's calling you now to come home. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. Remember what I said before, the invitations come to you now. But what happens is we can allow religion in and we look around, ain't nobody else moving, and we just stay seated. Get up and follow him. Because the call didn't come to them, the call came to you. You, you've been chosen. We're in the car driving and you said to me, I know I've been, you know you've been chosen. Nobody can tell you that, you know you've been chosen. You didn't even come from a Christian family, you said. There's no reason why you should be sitting here in a Hebraic roots congregation. In fact, the man that gave you your first Bible was a Catholic. Catholic. But Father's hand was on you and he led you through the wilderness and here you are. And here you'll stay, hallelujah. Mm, hallelujah. And we are a diverse people. Look around the room. Look around the room. Every shade of every color is here. Mixed multitude. Here, not because I specifically called you, the call came from the Shamayim, heaven. But the choice is, as you said, well, what do we do? In fact, that question was asked in the Bible. When the apostles, help me, Father, get me, get me get the right page. When the apostles preached the message and the believers said, well, what do we do now then? What do we do? Repent. Repent of where you were. Mm -hmm. And I've taught you before what the word repent means. Repent means you've been going this direction. You do 180 degrees and go that direction. But the word repent in Hebrew is connected with the word teshuvah. Mm -hmm. It means repent, turn, but return. You're not just turning, you're returning back to Father. The way, the truth, and the life. You've been taken away from the way. He wants you to return back to the way. 
Hebraic concepts are very easy to grasp. It's very simple. And fathers laid it down for you. And as was said, it was never taken away. But yet we see the dustbin bags going one direction towards the, the, the trolley, the bin truck. Why? Why? Because they don't understand. My people perish for lack of knowledge. But you know why they perish for lack of knowledge? And I want to go there today. The scriptures say that the lips of the priest are to preserve the knowledge of the Lord. Reason why the people do not understand the Torah is because they don't have real priests. Booyah. <laughs> The reason why the people are in famine, the reason why the people are dry, the reason why the people don't know is because they don't have real priests anymore. They have hirelings, hirelings. Men who have come into ministry and are not knocking them, they, they sincerely are in ministry, they believe, but they're in institutionalized religion. They're not in the way. How did you, friend, how did you get in here without wet garments on? They're in ministry, but you're not dressed in the right attire. That's why they don't know how to teach you what you're supposed to know. But they're sincere. They want to see you saved. They love people. They love the ministry. But when I do the investigation, friend, the Bible says that Yeshua is the door that you've got to go through him, but you came through Jesus. Mm. That's why you're in the wrong soul. <laughs> What's in the name? Everything in the name. Absolutely. Do you know the phrase, the devil's in the church? I'm always going to look at it in one way, but I'm actually going to think of it in another way, because if all of this has been instigated from people that are not of God, and have infiltrated what people of God believe themselves to be, and actually, if it's not a body, it is of the devil, isn't it? And so yep. the devil then physically, metaphorically, is the yep. angel of this branch. When I said to you before, if you can't beat them, the devil's slick you know. He's slick. He is so you can't when we put the devil down, remember who you're dealing with. He was a covering cherub. He was above most orders and ranks of heaven. And we want to talk about him like he was a fool and an idiot. Mm -hmm. He's more ingenious than any genius ever existed on this planet. So when we speak about the worst mistake you can ever make in war is underestimating your enemy. The minute you do that, you've lost. You've got to think. You've got to observe. Before you go in for attack, you've got to study your enemy. You've got to, I study things like Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, Art of War, love that stuff. Because I love warfare. I do love warfare. But you have to study war. Study war. And you realize the tactic of the enemy is sometimes not to beat you quickly, it's to starve you to submission. Mm. Not even expending a soldier. If I can just cut off your food supply, I never have to fire an arrow. I'll starve him. It might take a year, but I suffer no blood loss. I don't mind sitting here for a year and he eating my chicken and my pork. Yeah, that's what they would do. But they would starve Israel into death. In fact, starve Israel into abominations. Israel began to eat themselves. I'm going off topic, but let's let's analyze what we said. Today's session is just dealing with your paradigms. Because it's pointless me trying to teach you all this information if the mind isn't set right. So now our minds should be now open. We've gone through where the deception started. We know the laws were changed. We know religious systems were set up that were all about paganism from the get-go. Catholicism is paganism. It is just religious paganism. After all, if you're a Catholic or ex-Catholic, I'm not here to offend you, okay? Let's move on. We're gonna conclude with this video. You can get this video, it's called The Way, and this is pretty much what we're talking about here today. People from all over the world who are in the same situation, situation as you. And you will see black, white, Chinese, Asian. You will see the kingdom, but you also see the mindsets of those that you used to be around with before. Kick us as
David who says, we have friends who do not celebrate Christmas because they say December 25th is really a pagan holiday. While I agree that Jesus may not have been born on December 25th, he certainly was born as described in the Bible. How do I respond to that? Well, in a sense, tell them they're right. Uh, you see, the, the, the winter solstice a couple days later was the shortest day of the year, and the pagans had something called Saturnalia, and it was a time of lawlessness because all the laws were suspended, and people, the, a bunch of singers were actually wandered the streets naked singing, and, and then they had orgies, sexual orgies. It was a mass thing. Well, when the Catholic Church came along in Italy, the, the Romans and others didn't want to give up their holidays, so they said, okay, we'll Christianize it. And uh, so they said, okay, we'll say the birth of Jesus was the 25th of December. All this business about mistletoe, pagan. Christmas trees, pagan. Giving out gifts, pagan. Every bit of it is pagan. Every single bit of it is pagan. We've Christianized it all. And uh, so that's good. And so we have time. We celebrate for Jesus. And everybody gets all misty eyed. But the truth is, we, they're all pagan. <laughs> but the it's birth the of Jesus. But the intent of the heart is what it's about. Exactly. So we have Christianized all these things. We give gifts in the name of Jesus. We celebrate his birthday. And uh, it's a nice thing. And so I'm very delighted. And I like Christmas. I like all the decorations. The founders in is just loaded with decorations. It's very pretty. <laughs> All to celebrate Jesus. Yeah, but, but, but Christian that is Because this is timeless truth that they, as children of the kingdom, are supposed to know. And many of them are not going to hear this stuff anywhere else. Because many of my peers in ministry are more concerned in numbers. More concerned with just keep it, don't break in the, you know, keep the tie the same, keep the Christmas, keep the Easter, because people look to that. And as she was trying to say, but it's about the sentiment, but he was saying it's still pagan. Mm -hmm. You can't mix. That's what we do. We get too emotional. We tie up with the emotion. I remember Christmas. I remember as a kid loving it all. But it's pagan through and through. And it has nothing to do with Yahuwah. Nothing at all. Absolutely. In fact, I can show you in the Bible, the Father commands, because this thing about Christmas, we went on a long time before Satan came on the scene. Israel was being brought into it. Now Israel is still into it, but they call it Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. mm. I know some of you are thinking about Hanukkah is biblical, Hanukkah is historical, Hanukkah happened. Hanukkah, the event of the altar being taken back and the Maccabees is historical fact. But what happened regarding the oil lasting the eight days or the nine days, whichever it was, mm -hmm. is actually a Jewish fable. And the rabbis will tell you that. It didn't happen. There was no supernatural miracle of preserving the little bit of oil, light, while they had made, where they, they need a certain amount of days to make more oil. This light lasted the seven or eight days to make the new oil. It's all a Jewish fable, it didn't happen. Okay? Father has given you seven feasts, not nine. Look at the menorah. Mm -hmm. It's not nine biblical feasts, it's seven. I think I'm having this question week because we're just saying, people that are happy with where they are, they're not searching, they're not open to the truth of the word of God. They're not open to the truth of the word of God. So there's such an invitation to those. So how would you approach somebody who is, whether it's a Sabbath people or a Sunday people, um, to get them, to, how would you invite them um, with a view that, because the um, dictation is about, um, I think it's called induction. Yeah, so, it's, it's introducing you to the Hebrew roots, I know. We're talking about packaging it in a way whereby it's very friendly, <laughs> and not invasive. Yeah, but it's because I, I, I sent it out to about five or six people. Um, one person sort of said, be careful, the difference between two of them. I thought, okay, but he is someone who loves the service of God. Somebody else, um, I think they're just going to be coming down, or they're going to be sure. today. But a lot of the people that I met that are settled in the church have 
Yeah. Well, taking exactly what I've just said, I'm not going to change my clothes to try and win a different audience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We are who we are. And if you want to try and invite them, I recommend give them some links from the YouTube channel. Let them see what the video is all about. They can watch it from the comfort of their own home without coming here. And end of the day, if they if they hear his voice, my sheep. He's when I the, the beginning of the presentation was very deliberate. I am not interested in reaching the whole world because the whole world ain't gonna be saved. I am interested in reaching those who Yahuwah's hand is on and they love him. Yeah? I want to reach those. Those are like the way I had a conversation with Alex some time ago. And we had this very same conversation. I like his response. Was that people who are searching for you will find you. That's all I'm, that's, that's all I'm here for. For those who are seeking the way, will meet on the way. But those who are not really about my father's business, they won't be here. Just and I accept it. Anyway. Send the invitation. If they will hear, your job is to just throw the seed. You can't control what happens after that. Mm -hmm. I love having the conversation I had with uh, Ashley this morning. That a gentleman just came into his life at your school. Was it your primary school, was it? And he didn't know. He just gave this young boy a Bible, a Catholic Bible, hoping that he'd become a Catholic. Look where he is now. Because time and seasons are in Father's hands. So your job is just cast a seed, and this young man is now saved. We will reach those whose father has his hand on. So beyond that, it's out of your hands. Was that good for you to hear today, guys? Yes. And I want you to make a list of your questions. I appreciate that um, you see me here talking to you, but it is meant to be interactive. We are here to learn. I love the fact that Patricia asked the question, but we answer the question for ourselves, not for her. Because we need time, like we need time to process all of this. It's a lot. And I do appreciate that. And be like the Berean church. I keep talking about the Berean church. Mm -hmm. They went away and studied their Bibles to see if these things are true. Be like the Berean church. Go and search out the word from Genesis not Matthew, Genesis to Revelation to see if these things are true. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Let's close off with some questions. Any questions? I know some of you came in later than others, so you probably missed some bits at the beginning. So if you have any questions, now would be a good time. Ahabafellowship.com. So ahabafellowship.com. And you can go straight. If you scroll, when you get to the website, Scroll all the way down, you'll be on the About page. Scroll all the way down, and you'll see a Facebook and a YouTube link. Obviously, click on the YouTube, and it will take you straight to all of the teachings that I have. have. We are running Facebook and YouTube live, but we need to get ourselves a bit more organized so that it's actually recording the live sessions. But it, it, the intention is that it, there will be a live session, so if you're not able to make it, at least you can link into the line, but we will get that arranged between us. Any other questions? Okay. A few more seconds if you want to think of your question. That is your biblical menorah. That's the menorah of Israel. That would be the flag of Israel if the Rothschilds didn't take control of Israel. Mm -hmm. What you have now is not the flag of Israel. It's the flag that bears the symbol of the Rothschild family because they own the land given to it by the queen. So the menorah of Israel has seven branches which link up to the seven feasts of Yahuwah. Starting with Pesach. And Pesach then concludes all the way with Sukkot, the seven feasts. And maybe to, but, uh, to the seven spirits of God. Exactly. Yeah. The seven spirits of Yahweh. Isaiah 11? 11, yeah. Uh, Isaiah 11. But now the nine, where did the nine come from? So now they created um, a feast of Tammuz, fast of Tammuz. We said Tammuz was Nimrod reborn. But they have a day for fasting for Tammuz. And then they have Hanukkah that they added to it. 
But the reason why I tell you that Hanukkah is not of a divine plan behind it is because Father doesn't speak of it anywhere in the scriptures. If it's not in the law of Moshe, it's nothing to do with the kingdom. But where did it come from? People say, well, you know, the whole story, the Maccabees got back the temple and the temple was rededicated back. We know the story. It's in the book of Maccabees. But you've got to go back before. Where did this date come from? Because if you look in your calendar, Google it, you'll notice that sometimes Hanukkah falls on Christmas Day. This year it doesn't, but it moves. And it does fall on Christmas. The winter solstice is the key. Antiochus Epiphanes is the key. He divines through divination the date for the winter solstice, the date to take the, temp the, the temple and desecrate it was December 25th. So he is the instigator of the date. And all the Maccabees do is rededicate the altar on the day he took it. Mm. Tit for tat, but it doesn't make it right. So the date is from divination to divine. Well, we like the candles in a bit. We'll, we'll go through that in the service. But not all seven candles that we light. We like the candles, all seven, usually in the feast times. But the center candle, this one. Remember when I showed you the picture, and I said, take a picture of the first church. And I said to you, that seat is called the seat of Moses, because Moses sits in the seat of Yeshua. Okay? The throne room. Yeshua. So that seat was in the center of the room, the center candle, and the leader of the synagogue is called the Shemash, the leader. This is the Shemash, the center candle. It serves all the others. So the lighting of this one would light the other candles, okay? So Yeshua is the center. Mm. How many times have we seen? That's right. See center the center candle. So it's Yeshua is the center candlestick that feeds all the others. Put your shoe in the center, we all. Mm. Hallelujah. Any more questions? This one's um, something to do with what was going to be today. Well, I got confused because the Torah reading started a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. In my mind, it's supposed to start in the new year. Okay. So, in a whole So, I'm still confused with why we started in the So, the biblical new year, most of us should know, is actually Pesach. Pesach, is the, that's what's in your Bible. In your Bible, Yahweh says, this shall be the head of years. So Pesach, Passover, is New Year's Day. Hence why, when it comes to Passover, we need to get up and have a praise party. Because that is New Year's Day for us. It's, a, it's more than New Year's Day, it's the beginning of the years. It's the beginning of the feast. It's the head of the year. But then they have a ceremony in the fall, that's the month of, uh, we begin the month of Tishri, the fall feast, which became, the rabbis made it, a New Year celebration for the priesthood. So you have civil and ceremonial New Years. Okay, so kings would be coronated at the time of the month of Rosh Hashanah. So when Rosh Hashanah starts, they would coronate kings at that time. So there became this duality of New Years, to the point where, Yom Kippur, being the culmination of that high point, that high season, became so important, and it is, it took, it took, um, I don't know what I'm looking for, privilege, it prevailed over Pesach as being the new year. But Father always intended that Pesach would be the new year's day, okay? Because they would see as Yom Kippur, your sins were rolled away and the slate was clean, new beginnings. So we should get that. Yes, Father rolls away everything, new beginnings. But when we go into it, and that's another course I do, is understanding the feasts. How they show you prophetic eschatology. They show the end time plan of the whole world. Okay? So death and sin we know will be done away with. That's Yom Kippur. Okay? After Yom Kippur, what feast comes after that? Sukkot. There's no more dealing with sin, no more death. It's just Yahuwah tabernacling with man. Perfect peace. So all of the feasts tell you the prophetic plan of Father from beginning to end. As Bernadette said, without studying the feast, you don't know the plan. You don't know the order of things. Father's not willing that you should not know. He wants you to know. And the way he put it 
was through the feast, and where he put the feast was in the stars, that nobody can change it. That's why we look to the stars, we look to the heavens to know the times and the seasons. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Any more questions? Yeah. Nadine, yes. She's not here today. Um, I'll let her know that she's been asked for and she'll get a hubby and come back down. There are, so the question was asked earlier on by both brothers, which Bible translation should I go for? And I would say get all of them. <laughs> get the complete Jewish Bible, get the Hallelujah Scriptures Bible, um, if you want to get the Max, Malef, Messianic Aleph Tab Scriptures Bible, all of them serve different purposes and you'll, one has more information on something else, the other one has something else in there. So because you're a student, you don't just have one book. You have several. My go-to is a complete Jewish Bible, first point of call. When I'm studying, in preparing this, I look at the New King James, I look at NIV, I look at ESV, because I'm teaching to be students of the Word. Okay? But I would definitely recommend you need to have a complete Jewish Bible. One Bible that has everything about bringing what they call Jew and Gentile together. Okay? But once you're in Yeshua, you can no longer be a Gentile. Because Gentile means out of covenant. Once you're in Yeshua, you're in covenant. See, this whole thing of, you're a Gentile believer in Yeshua. Huh? That's an oxymoronic statement. It's a contradiction. Once you're in Yeshua, you're in covenant.